Hello and good day today at the ELFAP during the Freedom Games, the virtual edition of 2020 during the pandemic. Um, while we don't have the pleasure of seeing each other physically, um, I think it's fantastic that the Freedom Games are taking place this year. So big thanks to the organizers um, that make this possible. We are going to talk about combating disinformation techniques in the digital era, a topic that could not be more relevant. And as we have discussed already between the speakers, there are the dictator's playbooks still running hot these days. I have the big pleasure uh, welcoming a fantastic set of speakers today, starting with uh, Beata Biel from Concrete24. I have here uh, Jerzy Pujemnowski from the European Endowment for Democracy. And finally, Peter Pomoranchev, a visiting senior fellow at the Institute for Global Affairs at the London School of Economics. Um, I would like to do it very snappy today. That's why I will keep myself a little bit in the background and start rather with an opening statement from all the panelists and giving a little bit of an insight into the asymmetric fight between democratic coexistence and the disruption via disinformation techniques. So I want to have an idea what technologies are being used on a daily basis, maybe also things we don't talk and we don't know about. And I think what better way to start of giving someone from an actual news outlet the floor from Concrete24, Beata, maybe you can start today. Okay, I try to be prompt because when I start speaking, I have a tendency to speak quite fast and quite long. But anyway, um, this will be based on my experience both as a journalist and editor and also a media trainer um, and teacher's trainer. So uh, uh, we live in a world where we're just fast. We're just fast, uh, pr fastly producing content and fastly consuming the content. We live in a world where we are flooded with inf information. Every day there is more information and there is more and more disinformation, which we don't really notice because very often we are not educated enough to be ready to recognize what um, what disinformation, what fake content, what misinformation uh, is. Um, this is on one hand because we're not being taught about it at schools, at uh, especially at schools. Although uh, we don't have media literacy classes, and even if we do, they are largely focused on uh, old media. Actually, uh, another thing is that um, we very often think of disinformation only in terms of political processes, while current situation, pandemic situation, has shown us that this is a broader problem that is uh, connected to our health, our security, uh, and in the end, it comes up also to democracy. But we are so focused on politics that we very often don't consider disinformation and look at it from broader perspective. And I think thinking of democratic processes, I think that while speaking about democracy, uh, about disinformation, we need to leave the political scope only. We need to focus on other issues because we turn, tend to turn a blind eye to issues that are more connected to personal lives um, uh, that are disrupted, disrupting our everyday living. Uh, and, and in the broader scope, in the broader picture, they also disrupt our democracies. But I would go back to, uh, to, um, to disinformation as something that is very often very personally targeted. Thank you very much. A very quick follow-up question, um, especially as we are seeing in the corona pandemic, indeed, that disinformation also targets personal issues. Um, very heavily. Is that a, a, a shift of, of narrative that we also finally see that in public and not only the political sphere? Could you hear me? Sorry, I, I was disrupted. Was it... Uh... I yes, not... it was a follow-up question to... Uh, could you please what... repeat, because it was frozen. I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, follow-up question, because you said um, we have been focusing mainly on the political arena when it comes to disinformation. Now, in corona times, we have a very heavy focus on health topics and similar, where indeed this issue of fake, inf uh, fake news, disinformation, and partly also propaganda is being balled up also there. So do we see there a shift of... of um, 
acknowledgement? Do we see a shift of perception also when it comes to the problem that you just mentioned? Yeah, I, I think um, also the media shift on the kind of topics we're focusing now in media. You can go to many media outlets all around the world writing about disinformation focused on health. And I think it's crucially important because it's been there all around for a long time. If you think about Russian propaganda, it very often is not only political, but for example, you go to different discussion boards where people discuss um, how to bring up children and it's very personally targeted. And then the narratives switch to talking about how to bring up children, why the Eastern way of bringing them up is way better than the Western way. And the discussions turn into um, uh, 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 values, uh, not politics. It has nothing to politics uh, to do with politics. And very often people don't consider it this information or propaganda, while it is. So this poli uh, personal um, kind of disinformation was there for a long time, but we were so focused on the political one that we have a tendency to not notice other spheres. Thank you. Peter, um, we are sure going to talk about uh, things that Beata mentioned, gay ropa um, being something who follows the Russian or Eastern European media is one thing. But what are your two cents on the topic on uh, fighting disinformation in the digital era? Yeah, I mean, look, in a sense, disinformation is disinforming content is, is nothing new. Um, I think it's worth kind of stepping back a bit and thinking what uh, the digital era has brought us that's new in disinformation. And here it's not so much about the content, um, but much more about disinforming behavior, um, mass coordinated and authentic behavior, the ease with which you can create thousands of fake online accounts, the way you can use people's data to target this without their understanding, which is also a form of deception because people don't understand how their own data is being used to target them. So we're talking about targeting, amplification, and disinforming behavior which the technology has made possible. And at the end of the day, there's, you know, it's not such a big deal or anything that new if you know, there's one Russian fake news newspaper in the US trying to swing the US election. The problem is that there are tens of thousands of fake accounts pushing the message. And indeed, if we're talking about disinformation, the content is often not disinformation in the sense that the content can be values driven, which is just an opinion, or it can be just Trump is great or the AFD is great. It's not it's a, and that's not disinformation. You know, there's no kind of like the content itself is neutral. It's the behavior that is deceptive. And that's what I think is, is so new in, in, the digital, in the digital era and where we really have to focus our gaze in terms of innovating, what to do about it in terms of regulation and also in a philosophical level. I think the digital era has put under question um, the premises on which we base a... Um, a democratic theory of the information environment. Namely, you know, the 20th century kind of bequeathed to us a few axioms through which we made sense of what a democratic information environment was. Freedom of speech versus censorship, pluralism versus a single state media, and the metaphor of a marketplace of ideas and the idea of a public sphere where different types of discourse caused political change. All that's been put under question. We see freedom of speech being abused by authoritarian and also democratic regimes in order to sort of drown out discourse, sort of censorship through noise, um, which is uh, an innovation that we haven't really found a way to conceptualize legally, let alone technologically. Uh, we see pluralism tip over into polarization so extreme that the idea of a common public sphere where we all debate with each other uh, in a common democracy is starting to break down. And of course, you know, and that's partly because of, of, of the digital situation where people inhabit different online ecosystems. And of course, um, the whole metaphor of a marketplace of ideas seems very, very questionable in an era when you at the click of a button, you can create mass amounts of disinforming behavior or disinforming content. It's completely unclear that the best information will somehow rise to the top through some you know, theory of rational choice. So it's a systemic crisis, a systemic challenge. Uh, that's the one we're facing. And really, we haven't found neither the kind of the conceptual and philosophical ways of which to deal with it, the technological ones, and we're rushing towards the regulatory ones. You know, there's a real push to regulate this space, 
which is understandable. I think regulation is needed. But without having thought through the other two, I do fear the regulation will be suboptimal. Thank you very much. Regulation, surely something we'll be discussing later. And I have a couple of questions, especially to you when it comes for us to something that I like to uh, call the Instagramification of content and information. Um, Jerzy, um, your two cents on the topic. Well, as a very strong uh, uh, terminology and definition, uh, issues were already addressed, uh, and I fully agree uh, with the other panelists. I would focus on something that I believe uh, is uh, extremely important from the broader perspective. Uh, because we are facing a change uh, um, of the society and the change that is caused by digital age, inevitably. Uh, where, where this uh, change is heading, it is a part of the question that Peter was asking uh, about philosophy, uh, how the society will change, how the society and state organizations or uh, upper state organization will address this. This is a still open question, but inevitably change is, is, is happening. It, it started with the massive, uh, uh, massive use of algorithms that initially were meant to make money, but very quickly uh, uh, political actors discovered that they can make also politics and they are using them. It also connects to artificial uh, intelligence, but most important, it is uh, a total change in information uh, creation and information spread, which was already mentioned. Everyone ultimately today is a journalist. And we are facing a similar situation as a civiliz I mean, of course, not in a good sense, but in a practical sense, can produce content that is disseminated widely, potentially. Uh, so in that sense, yes, but uh, you, you're right, they are not journalists, uh, but, uh, but in, in, a, in a practical sense, uh, disseminating information. But uh, if we look into the uh, uh, a change that happens when the massive production of flyers, printed media, uh, was became possible and became in use. I am talking about end of 19th, end of 18th century, uh, a French Revolution, and later. That was the beginning of the shift where information was accessible to many people, not necessarily educated, not necessarily rich, but many. And that allows, by the end of 19th century, to creation of the I mean, to consolidation of the representative uh, democracy. Now, I think societies are beginning to believe that something like direct democracy is possible. Something that I will have an app on my phone and I don't like this minister, I click and it's out. That's what Trump creates this kind of you know, possibility. That's what President Zelensky in Ukraine was saying. I will elect, uh, I will choose my minister of defense via Facebook. You just vote, you just click and I will pick the name. So that type of feeling that is also built by the business, by all those talk shows, I mean, uh, uh, show business, uh, not talk shows, I think talent shows and all kinds of you know, uh, ways where people simply click, vote, and then they see next day on the screen the winner. This is the feeling that is deep, deep, deep now in the people's mind. That is also the fertile ground for populists who are giving an easy solution. They're saying, vote for us, everything is done overnight. So this is an extremely and the biggest challenge for democracy as we know it today. It will find its way, but from the legal point of view, from the technology point of view, how we will support this new form of democracy that will be some kind of direct democracy in the 10, 20 or 30 years, I don't know. This is the biggest challenge because before that, we will face all dramatic uh, um, dramatic processes that are happening now, the victory of, of, of populism, the polarization of society, lack of ability to deal with disinformation, ignorance that is a driving factor for successful populism and all other fears, plus retreating to the known comfort zones, tribalism, all kind of, you know, uh, simple divisions without reflection. And that is uh, a process that is, in my view, inevitable, but how we will reach there and what, what cost, this is an open question. 
Thank you very much. And I would like to bring your statement just together with what Peter just said before. Um, on the one hand, we have something that, um, as I said, uh, Instagramification of content, of information. Back in the day, we had a newspaper that was researched, then TV, radio, uh, information uh, spans ever got shorter, um, then Facebook, Twitter, and now you have to uh, say everything, not only with a tweet, but with a picture. Um, which obviously has negative effect on the political discourse. And at the same time, Yerzi, I want to follow up on something you said, and that seems to be a problem with the expectations for direct democracy and this, this dangerous uh, game that we see with information. This permanent availability paradigm that seems to be coming up, this inst um, instant political gratification um, demand that, that, we, that we see here, that not only Zelensky's and others, um, have, but also Fridays for Future say, we won't change now, and this is how it has to be. So is this together the biggest threat for democracy that we see at the moment, Yerzi? Well, it is not a threat to democracy itself. It is a threat to democracy as we know it today, as it is organized today. And that's why I'm saying this process already started, but we will face a lot of crises and costs to reach a new solutions. Uh, both legally, regulatorily, and in every other aspect, psychologically, uh, people, and that is the good part, people felt and demand the participation in this very, very, I could say, the basic sense. I click, I decide, I want, I want to see it now, result of my decisions, of my choices. That's why also why people are so unhappy when the counting of election takes so much time. And that what we see now uh, in, in, in US, it's opened so much space for all kinds of new conspiracy theory and, and, and polarization. So in a sense, in, in every sense, this speed of information that was caused by new technologies uh, is also uh, transferred or translated now into the speed of democratic change. People want change now, they don't want to wait. And that is exactly at the same time, of course, as always in the history, threat, challenge, and opportunity. Thank you. Beata, you as an educator, as a, as a journalist, um, do we see here propaganda on speed with um, a very, very hung, um, information hungry and hung, hung information addicted populace? Yeah, I would say it's uh, disinformation on speed or any other drugs, but that one that is acting very fastly, faster than ever before. Uh, that we see action and reaction uh, uh, almost at the same time. Um, uh, and uh, I just wanted to follow up on what uh, Yezhu was saying also. Just one, one thing is it's very important that it's also uh, this online participation could be an opportunity, especially to have young people involved in democratic processes, to have them go to the elections, to turn the turnout, make them more interested in, um, uh, in, uh, uh, in democratic processes. But then asking your, uh, answering your question, the same participation as the elections in the US in 2016 uh, showed, and the Russian influence on the elections, the way the participation was used. We know about the groups that were created by the Russian troll factories to make people go out in the streets, to make people clash with one another, even if on Facebook only. Uh, it was making people feel they participate in democratic processes while it was not connected either to candidates or election processes at all. So this is what I would, if you're saying uh, that it's propaganda, that it's um, like propaganda on speed, that's the thing. So in the previous times when we only had old media, it took time. Now the time is like so very short. So we just create a Facebook group and here we are, we have thousands of people that we can disinform and people are made to act. Even if it's just acting on Facebook, then it floods the whole internet space and, uh, and it's very, very effective. So yes, unfortunately that's the time and probably uh, it's very difficult to curb. Like usually, if you put somebody on drugs, you can have um, you can have solutions how to deal with it. Uh, uh, you can have a rehab, and you have ideas what a rehab is. 
with disinformation, with the one that we have, what, that we see online, we're always a step behind. Or, I mean, it's a very optimistic view, actually, that we're a step behind. Very often we're, we're 100 steps behind. So it's a very difficult way. It's very difficult to ha have a rehab, an idea of what a rehab should be. Thank you. That is fantastic. Peter, um, you were talking um, about uh, misinformation behavior and systemic change. How much is this sobering up in, in terms of media consumption, media literacy, but also the new, new threats to disinformation? How um, do we have to factor that in into systemic change? What extent do we have to factor media literacy in, or or the whole the whole situation with um, the, the whole situation? How do we factor in this whole situation in the systemic change that sure, we see, sorry. and that the the follow up changes that we need and need to steer? Sure. Look, Daniel, it's it's really quite basic. Um, we have to change the regulatory framework, reinvent the meaning of media, media, and redesign uh, the internet. So if we get those three things right, we should be okay. So regulation. So uh, so, so simple. Yeah, I know. I know. It's just, like, just reinvent our media landscape. Um, look, regulation. Look, the, the regulation, you know, we can get into a huge discussion and try and bring it down to one really simple principle. I think we have to think about what is, I think we can base our regulation in something coherent and building on human rights legacy. If we just think about what is an empowered citizen online. Yeah, at the moment, you know, even though there's so much information everywhere, the citizen has very little idea about how the information environment is created, why algorithms show you one thing and not another. There's no democratic oversight of algorithms. Um, there's no democratic control of algorithms, let alone oversight. Um, which of our own data is being used to target us? Uh, what information is being targeted at my neighbor? We live in the dark, weirdly surrounded by lots of information, but with no understanding about how it's constructed. And so you get these absurd situations where the Trump team goes, aha, Google pushes liberal news up and conservative news down. And the thing is, we don't know. Maybe they do. We have no idea. So we can't have our public sphere in a black box. Ultimately, I think we need democratic control over algorithms. We can think about how do we build in those, that control. That's the regulatory part. Along with that, I think we need a, a democratic theory of information security. We can't use the term sovereignty. That's been taken by China and Russia. But we need our own theory of defense. We need our own theory of what is information aggression. And we should think about something like a NATO 2.0, so, you know, which Ukraine, I think, should be part of. If Ukraine is attacked with a piece of information aggression as defined in international law, then, you know, the reply comes from Germany or something like that. So that's the, that's the kind of regulatory and kind of like policy bit. Uh, then we need to think, what, what is media's role in this new world? I think Yerji made some brilliant points. If we move towards this more direct democracy, and I, I hope it won't be the, the types he talks about, there are many other things which I think are exciting. Um, what is the role of media to support that? But also, look, if, if our great challenge is fracture and polarization, which I think a lot of people now recognize, that's certainly the political strategy of both dictators and populists. Um, is part of media's role, not the only role, but as part of media's role, going back to these core principles that the BBC was created with of overcoming polarization, of building di dialogue and discourse between fractured bits of society. I mean, everyone's conclusion after the US elections is that, my God, what a divided society. Well, whose job is it to bring this society together into a common conversation? Sadly, I think media is probably making things worse at the moment by firing up their own side, playing into the polarization, which is related to the you know, financial incentives of the internet as it's at the moment um, designed. Um, you make money by being polarizing, by hating on the others and charging up your own side. So we get to the design. And I do think we have to start thinking about um, online spaces that are not driven by likes and shares, that are not driven by sucking up your data, that are driven around democratic ideals and are geared towards furthering democratic discussion. There's nothing wrong with Instagram or Facebook being used for kittens or teenagers showing off their new trainers. Fine. It's just not the place we should be having our social and political discussion. We need new spaces for that. That means designing these new spaces. That means getting support for them um, within regulations and to help them flourish because they'll be, I think, non-commercial and public spaces. 
but it's also to make them important. Yeah, we can, I can just imagine an EU social media, yeah, which will be so virtuous in line with every convention on human rights and it'll be so boring, no one uses it. I mean, that's just the sort of process the EU would initiate. Um, I think we already had this with GDPR, which was like, you know, beautiful on paper, just annoying in practice for so many people. Um, it has to really get to the point that GSG was talking about. And we need a public space which does make people feel empowered, which makes them feel part of the political process, which is practical because it's where you get your street fixed or your local council elected, which maybe you do give up a little bit of your data in order to improve health. Yeah, just giving up data for health reasons. I think people will agree to that, not for commercial reasons. So we've got to create these public online spaces which are vital and have, I don't know, the joy of democracy built into them, um, which is something we can't forget about. So those are, that's my quick three-step solution. Do it tomorrow. Ah, very simple. I'm very glad that we indeed have quick fixes for us. Okay, tomorrow we will get to work. Jerzy, um, I, from, from what I get, is uh, reminds me of my philosophy classes back in the day when Plato was talking about the dangers of democracy, um, the, the, the ruling... Of, of, of the commons of, of, the, of the masses. And um, so we have the danger here. Have we been a bit naive about the virtues, about the possibilities that the internet would bring? There's a very famous meme. And um, do you remember when we thought that access to information would solve all, all our problems and uh, get rid of stupidity? That wasn't it. So um, have we been too naive about that? And have, has this naivety um, been exploited by the forces uh, around there? I don't think so. It's not about naivety. We are always surprised by technology, always in the history of humankind. And this is something that exactly is the definition of progress, of development, that things happen, and then human mind has to adapt to it, has to bear consequences of it. So uh, I wouldn't blame anyone if you would imagine that uh, there is a, some committee who approves and disapproves new technologies to be in use uh, uh, that is so by organized humanity, uh, you know, having a certain uh, legitimacy to do so. That's absurd. Uh, so things happen. And, uh, and uh, indeed, uh, it is uh, true that, uh, that uh, elites were taken by surprise by internet. They did not discover the dark part of mass information, quick flow, quick access to information, lack of certain quality control. We have to remember that internet started by scientists, by elite people who believe how can you, how can it be possible to put not true information there? Because all their ethical code was based on presenting true, confirmed scientific results. That's in the early 90s how internet was built. So their mind was too narrow to see the danger at that time. Probably no one was even concerned because they were simply using this as an excellent opportunity to place their articles and, and communication about scientific research. So I wouldn't blame anyone here. I would simply live with it. And it's our role now, the generation that lives today, to find solution, and I, I pretty uh, sign up to all Peter said. These are basic three, I would say, pillars of our way forward to address uh, issues that we have now. We have diagnosed the problem, and now it's time for remedy. Thank you. Um, Beata, coming, touching upon one of the pillars that, that Peter mentioned, and that is the information issue and the well, having more objective information, curated information. I mean, this would be the role of the media indeed. But looking at Poland, Hungary and, and other places, isn't there also a very inherent danger that if we have the neutral information in the hate of the state again, that we have not only the free-floating, overwhelming information out there, but also the danger of state propaganda finding the, uh, its way back and having that as the baseline of information? Well, that's why actually we still go back to the second pillar Peter was mentioning. You need strong, 
objective is kind of a more difficult word nowadays. Uh, very often it's not mentioned anymore with the media when you say, but unbiased media, uh, strong democratic, um, supported by the citizens media. Uh, then, then, then even if you, you're facing the state propaganda, it becomes easier if you have the social support, if people understand the importance of the media, if people understand what, um, what media actually is, what they need it for, how important uh, trustworthy media is in their lives. Um, uh, so so uh, I, I think it's very, uh, the, fourth, uh, the fourth pillar I would say to what Peter was saying is an educated society. Um, currently the societies, and it's not just Poland, it's not just Hungary, I would say it's an issue overall in Europe. We don't have special classes to teach young students on how to be secure online, on what algorithms are, what media literacy is. This is the first step to understand what media is. To support the media, you need to understand what their role in the society is. And it's very often undermined it's very often uh, uh, often um, hate directed at the media. So, so their position, if you ask the Polish readers, if you look at the Reuters uh, Institute's reports or any other reports on uh, social trust towards the media, it's very low in Poland. And one of the reasons is that people don't understand the importance of the media. It can be uh, lining a bit towards the left if it's describing itself that way. It can be lining towards the right a bit if it's uh, describing itself that way, but you need to be aware of it. You need to be aware of its position. You need to be aware of why it's acting like this and what it's what is the media's values. And I think we largely lost it in Poland uh, and that's why the people don't trust the media anymore. Um, so to, to stay uh, for the media strong, trustworthy, it needs to be, I think that this is my main, main, main um, view, it needs to be su supported by the society, it needs to be understood by the society. So um, in Hungary, uh, this is a great picture of people not standing for the media they were reading, they were watching. People did not go out in the streets to support the media at least not in the beginning, maybe later, you know, when next uh, media outlet was falling apart, or it was being bought up by, by the friends of Orban or other politicians, then it but it was already too late. People got to understand what the value of the media and democracy is way too late. So I think we as the media, but also uh, as societies, as uh, non-governmental organizations, we need to put more stress on explaining to the people why media is important. And um, I very often talk about it to my students at the university and they don't consume media. They, when I ask them, where did you get the information from? It's from the internet. Where from precisely? From Facebook. They don't even know the media outlets. So this is also what we need to take um, care of to to be closer to young people. I don't need them to come to my website every day and read it. I want them to come there when something important for the democracy for, or for their lives is happening, that they know where is the place to come for information, not just some opinions, not just uh, uh, biased, uh, uh, biased, let's call it, it, you cannot call informational facts biased, but that they know where to come from to, to, to find information that is crucial for their lives. Um, so uh, I would say more education, uh, media closer to younger people. Uh, I think this is a great challenge we're standing uh, in front of to keep the democracy alive, but also to keep the media alive. Peter, um, well, coming back to what, what you said about having this more objective media, isn't to play a little bit the devil's advocate, isn't that again something that would create a, a scenario where we have state entities um, deciding on what um, objective information is um, and at the same time that the people should decide and, and be part as civil society of the content? Isn't that also the danger that this um, the same algorithms and the, the same biases and the same um, drive of people to get to certain kind of information will also prevail, that we have this um, headlines of, oh, um, he was going into the shop and you will not uh, believe what happens next. So this will still be um, what people click because we are wired that way. So 
Yes, we can educate people. Yes, we can have um, tr uh, have a try to have some objective media. But will people not still consume this kind of media? And aren't we running into if we want to have this objective baseline, running into the problem that we open the door again for state-controlled media? Um, I mean, not not. I mean, that's about governments, really. The whole question of state control, and that's you know the problems in Hungary and increasingly in Poland. I mean. Not even to do with audience strategy. That it's got to do with rule of law and things like that. Which, which um, you know, the fact that um, you know, the fact that those sort of takeovers of public broadcasting and increasing, you know, attacks on private media um, are possible. Um, really, sort of, you know, brings under question, you know, to what extent, you know, the EU is a guarantor of of, <laughs> of the country being a, a full democracy. Um, so I think I think I think that, that those are slightly different 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 things. Um, but let's take somewhere like like you know America, where there's no particular risk of that. Um, you know, we've woken up. Well, for a while we've been in a world where it seems that a good percentage of the country dwells in a separate reality. It seems that way. Um, that's sort of the sort of the line hammered home by what's often known as the right-wing echo chamber, which includes sort of a lot of, a lo a lot of media now, not just Fox News in its prime time uh, version, but also a lot of online media. Uh, and we've seen in a lot of countries, in Italy, in the US, how the online right ecosystem has pulled the old right-wing TV channels even further right. There's been very good research to show how that's done. So the question is, who, whose job is it to get up in the morning and get a Fox News viewer and a CNN viewer to talk to each other? Um, in my philosophy of public service media, which is very much kind of built on the BBC ideals of the 1920s, um, where there was a similar situation where the idea of, you know, the BBC when it was conceived was not just the stuff about objective, sure, accurate, sure, much more than that. It was to create a coherent public sphere. It was to bring society together in one democratic conversation. That was the point of it. That was the, 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 the purpose. Uh, the objective and accurate bits were just kind of things along the way. So whose job is it to do that? Maybe that's not going to be, maybe that's my very B BBC English sort of background. Maybe in America, it's something else. Maybe in America, it's a whole movement, a new movement of civil society, sort of civic media. Whose job is it to um, create this, this, this new public sphere, to create these new conversations? I would say, I think there's a lot more hope even though we see a lot of elite driven polarization. So a lot of channels and politicians saying, we are divided, we live in different realities. When you start looking at the sociology, when you start looking at the polling, when you start looking at focus groups, there's actually much less division. We've just been doing a lot of work in Hungary. 20% of the population pretty much follow the Orban cultural narrative. Most people don't. Most people want more different types of media. They want to be reached out to. They don't trust the government narratives. I think in America as well, if we were to start picking apart what we think is one block, the Fox News viewer will find it's actually 20 different types of viewer. And we should start thinking about which ones live in a radical conspiratorial environment, which is very hard to communicate with, and which ones aren't, which ones have stopped trusting mainstream media for you know, maybe more valid reasons. So I think it's about understanding audiences. It's about reconnecting the public. Um, and it's about seeing whether we can still survive as, you know, as, as imagined communities. I mean, that's really what's at stake. Can we survive as publics? Um, that's not guaranteed. Um, you know, if you look at the theory of how nations and states are formed, some theoreticians like you know, Benedict Anderson would say it was only because we had newspapers, only because we had novels and newspapers that we could, could come together as an imagined communities. We read the same things, we had a similar sense of time, we had a similar sense of domestic and foreign, which was shaped by the media environment. It was the media environment that made the nation possible. Maybe this new, incredibly fractured information environment makes the nation impossible. That is an interesting point that I would like to elaborate a little bit more with Yerzi. Uh, and that is the perceived divide of society. Um, we hear a lot, uh, especially now when we look at the, the US election, there are the Republicans and the Democrats, and there's nothing in between. The CNN viewer and the Fox News. They're fundamentally opposed to each other. Um, Yerzi, how much of that do you think is actually true? How much is the society divided and how much is, are these algorithms and um, these new means, these new technologies 
create an, an imaginary threat, an imaginary divide in our societies? No, uh, uh, this is clear. Algorithms makes money, algorithms makes politics, this we already said. And this is uh, the process that we are actually now diagnosing and we are already quite sure how uh, destructive uh, for democracy it is. The question is what we can do uh, to fight it back. And beyond what uh, P uh, Peter was uh, saying, I would try to, to, to reduce in a sense for the, sense, for the sake of this discussion, uh, the, the kind of scope uh, into very simple uh, formulas. First, it is uh, trust, rebuilding trust. Uh, the most, and as we know with Peter, we were together debating on many occasions, the most expensive and most difficult commodity, most precious commodity is a trust nowadays. And whether we talk about dictatorship or whether we talk about democracy in both environments, it is true. And the second very important aspect of human life is restoring activism, a real activism human to human connection, not only online, but also offline. And we see this throughout the whole world, how people in Belarus, where everyone was giving up on Belarus, that nothing will happen in this country. People are on the street. They are seeing each other. They are connecting and they are coordinating through telegram channels on local basis not as a big messages, but just what next, what happens in this or that house, whether where we can hide when the uh, Oman police will uh, will be after us. So they are giving addresses where there is a, you know, uh, a courtyard you can hide um, uh, because police is chasing you. So these elements of rebuilding trust, of communication, of rebuilding trust of interhuman relationships is an answer to all those dangers. And based on this, we are rebuilding also trust to different sources, people, leaders, and that's the only way how we can readdress or rebuild society uh, that is able to resist both threat of dictatorship, threat of disinformation, manipulation, populism, and all kinds of extremism that we know and polarization, including, uh, including it. That is a chance to rebuild dialogue because people who are together on the streets they are not of the same views but they have same reason to go on street and they will trust each other and they will start talking to each other that's the beginning of dialogue and the end of polarization and that's how we can see the reality in the future real activism is an answer rebuilding small uh, medium-sized ngos in societies rebuilding ability of societies to talk to each other through those small circles it's not a Tocqueville who invented this. This is just how we know it works. And this is exactly where we have to go back in order to go to the upper level with the new style democracy one day when we are ready. Thank you. So it is possible to, to overcome this divide. The divide is not as deep as we might feel, but it's the algorithms that show us that there is a divide. Beata, Last question for you, because indeed you are an educator, um, is how can we make sure that we can, up, uh, can keep up with the speed of this information and educating our youngsters in maybe one minute? So how do we, don't we lose the, the, the arms race here? Well, we have to, first of all, uh, under, remember that very often they know about the internet way more than we do. So we have to follow up on what they know, what tools they're using, be closer to them. We cannot speak from the level just of an educator who knows everything, from media outlet that knows everything. We need to go to their level, lose, use tools that they know, uh, not talk only about politics, yeah. exclude politics, but also talk about issues that are important to them. Environment, climate, uh, social issues like LGBT rights. This is what they're talking about. And this is the focus we could be using uh, other than politics to have them involved. And um, as Jerzy was saying, trust is the key. And also, also Patty Noonan once said that when people believe nothing, they will believe everything. So that's what we need to focus on. So any issues that is related to the youth and internet users, we should be covering them in education, not just politics. Perfect. I think that is a perfect closing for, for today's panel. Rebuilding trust, rebuilding communities, um, rebuilding civil society, teaching about the issues that we have at hand, and of course, Peter's three pillars that are most interesting that we heard about 
today. Indeed, we can fight it. We don't have to resort to the same techniques that the perpetrators of fake information have. We have to go back to our ideals. But we also have to be clear that there is this bias, um, that there is this permanent availability uh, problem, instant gratification um, problem that people see in politics and that we need to overcome and explain. All three of you, thank you very much. All our viewers, thank you very much for tuning in on the <laughs> Sunday at lunchtime. We appreciate it a lot here at Freedom Games at the Alpha. Thank you very much. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.